Praise the Lord. Uh, we've had a really wonderful time of worship, uh, hearing songs and uh, testimonies of what uh, God uh, has done for us and continues to do for us. Uh, so today morning, uh, for today's morning's message, I've taken a topic that is very close to my heart and something I feel God has taught me over the years about himself. Very often when we read the Bible, we're looking for something for ourselves. We're lo looking for something that I can get, something I can, you know, receive. But the Bible was primarily written to, to reveal God's character, to reveal his heart. And as we hear that and as we study that, the Holy Spirit shows us our own hearts and where we stand and where he wants to work in our lives. So can we have the slides? So the title for the sermon is The Timeliness of a Timeless God. Before we go into that, uh, take a look at that clock. Take a look at that clock. What's wrong with it? There's no time on it. It's just a bunch of numbers, right? I put that picture just to kind of illustrate for God, time doesn't mean the same as it means for you and me. He doesn't need to wake up in the morning. He doesn't need to have his breakfast or have lunch or do anything and uh, like we do, right? So we'll start with the verse uh, from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the heart of man, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. God's relation to time is a very difficult concept. It's not easy uh, to fully grasp uh, with our uh, you know, finite minds. But God, he is timeless, uh, and yet he interacts with us in time you know, time, place, or person in a way we can understand, in a way we can hear from him, we can learn from him and have communion with him as his children. So what, what, what is God's relation to time? Did time always exist? That's a strange question, uh, you know, if you think about it. Time doesn't mean much to God because he is timeless. He has never changed. He's always been the same yesterday, today, and forever. In that sense, he is timeless. If something doesn't exist, it has no con connection to time, right? So if you and I didn't exist, we had no beginning till we started, you know, we were born. The same way, everything uh, that existed, everything that, existed, it, that exists has some sort of time property, right? It has a beginning, it has an end maybe. But God is different. Again, those are big concepts. We're not going to delve into all the, uh, the, 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 the theory behind all of that. But what we're going to look at is some very practical uh, reflections on understanding of how God interacts with us in our, in our lives. If you look at Isaiah chapter 57, verse 8, he talks about God who is on high, the Holy One, who still takes time to interact with people who are small and are, you know, are like us, right? He is big, uh, big enough to be beyond time and space. Can we have the next slide? But he is, he, he has the time in one sense to come down and interact with us. He is a sovereign God who is con in control of everything. If he was not in control of everything, he really can't be God. He really can't be God if he's not in control of everything. You know, if you look at literature and, the, you know, they talk about father time, an old man with a beard and a, a stick and a little clock sometimes. And the Greeks called him Kronos, the God of time. But our God is different because he, the Bible tells us he is in control of the past, present, and future. Lord of all eternity, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. In 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, it says, All things exist from God and for God. Everything, we all exist for his glory. Can we have the next slide? So when we look around us, we can measure things like, you know, we can touch, feel, 
you know, some things have length, height, weight. Those are things because we are in a material world, which is different from where God exists as a spirit, as the Bible says. He is still, though he is spirit, he still is able to interact with us in our time and space. Next slide, please. So we're going to look at few interactions that God has had over time with his people and how his perfect timing in their lives, uh, you know, can be demonstrated. So if you look at the life of Joseph, everybody, I presume, knows the life of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Jacob, uh, the youngest son in the book of Genesis, and he was the favorite son. Jacob showered all his blessings and love and affection and probably was very partial uh, to, to Joseph too. But if you look, take a closer look at what happened afterwards, his life basically fell apart. His brothers became jealous of him. His brothers you know, threw him in a pit, uh, sold him off, and he ended up in Egypt in a foreign country, uh, basically serving other people, going to jail. And where was God in all of this? Joseph had some wonderful dreams from God. And he told everybody that he's going to be great and he's going to rule over everyone. But where was God in all of this? Where was God's timing? Where was God's sense of timing? And where was God's promises? But if we look towards the end of the story, we knew, we see that Joseph was exactly where he needed to be. Joseph was exactly where he needed to be when his uh, country was going through a crisis when his country was going through a famine and all kinds of problems, God had already chosen Joseph to be exactly where he needed to be in a position of power, privilege, and authority to take care of his family. Next, we look at another example uh, of God's timing uh, in the book of Esther. Those uh, of us who are very familiar with the story, Esther was a Jewish woman who became a queen in, in the kingdom of Persia. And that again was God's, God's uh, provision, God's providence, and God's timing. And they, the Jews were at the brink of you know, being destroyed because of a plot by uh, Haman, the advisor to the king. God placed her in perfect time in that place. One of my favorite sentences there in Esther chapter 4 and verse 14 is, Maybe you, uh, uh, her cousin Mordecai tells Esther, who was nervous or who was afraid, maybe you were made for such a time as this. Maybe, maybe God placed you there just for this. Because, you know, I'm sure she was nervous. She was a Jew Jewish woman in, in, the, in the court of the Persian king, and she was afraid. But God's assurance that you were made for such a time as this. God puts people... In, in different places, in different positions, in his own timing, in his own way, because he knows what is best. We'll look at one more example. Uh, Daniel, uh, all of us know Daniel's story. The first question that comes to my mind is, why, why didn't God prevent Daniel from going to the lion's den? Could have been so much easier, less dramatic, less drama, right? But God allowed him to go into the lion's den God shut the mouth of the lion. And then what happened? God gets the glory. God got the glory. And if you see what the king said afterwards, he glorified Daniel's God. He glorified God for the miracle. So God got his glory through some of these interactions, some of these, you know, in time interactions, or however you call it, God, God did his bit by putting people in the right place at the right time. For the next example is the example really which we want to focus on for today is a different kind of scenario. So let's first listen to it and then we'll talk more about it. I'll call Karen to come and tell us about John chapter 11 verse one and to 43. All right, so this is our scripture reading for today. I'm gonna to tell us the scripture reading from John chapter 11. This is a story from God's word. So there's a man, and his name is Lazarus, and he lives in a town called Bethany with his two unmarried sisters, Mary and Martha. Now Mary is later going to be the one who anointed Jesus' feet with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. 
This Mary's brother, Lazarus, is sick, really, really sick. So they send a messenger to Jesus. He's about two days away preaching and teaching with his disciples. And they send a messenger to him to say, your dear friend Lazarus is sick. And Jesus says, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. This is here for the glory of God so that the Son of Man will be glorified. And even though Jesus loved Lazarus and he loved Mary, he loved Martha, he stayed away for two more days. And then he told his disciples, okay, let's go. We're going to go back to Judea. And the disciples said, wait, wait, hold on. We were just there a few days ago, and they were trying to stone you. You really want to go back again? And Jesus said, There's only 12 hours of daylight in a day. During that time, it's safe for people to move around because they have the light of the world. But night is soon coming when it's going to be dark and there's danger of people stumbling. We're going to go back. Our dear friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, and I'm going to wake him up. And the disciples said, okay, well, if he's just asleep, then I'm sure he's going to wake up again. And Jesus said, knew that Lazarus had died, but they didn't get it. So Jesus said plainly, Lazarus is dead, but I'm actually glad that I wasn't there at the time for your sake, because now you'll come to believe through this. Come on, let's go see him. And Thomas, one of the disciples whose nickname was the twin, he turned to the other disciples and said, yep, let's go with Jesus. I guess we're all going to die with Jesus. So they all went back to Bethany And as they were coming back to Bethany, they started hearing that Lazarus had died. He'd actually been dead for four days at this point. Bethany is about three kilometers away from Jerusalem. So people from Jerusalem had come to be with Mary and Martha, to grieve with them and mourn with them. So as they were approaching, Martha saw him and ran out of the house to greet Jesus and said, Teacher, if you had only been here, our brother would not have died. But even now I know if you ask God for anything, he'll give it to you. And Jesus said, your brother will live again. And Martha said, yeah, yeah, I know. At the end times when we're all resurrected, yeah, he'll live again. And Jesus said, no, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after he's died. And if anyone lives in me and believes in me, they'll never really actually die. Do you believe this, Martha? And she said, yeah. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who was sent into the world from God. And then she ran back to go get uh, Mary, who was still back in the house with the grieving people. And she pulled Mary aside, and she said, hey, the teacher is here, and he wants to see you. So Mary got up quickly, and she went out to go see Jesus. And the mourners didn't know what was happening. They thought she was going out to the tomb. So they got up, and they followed her out there. And as soon as she got to Jesus, she fell at his feet, and she started crying. And she said, teacher, if only you had been here, our brother would not have died. And Jesus felt so much emotion well up inside of him right there. And he said, where have you placed him? And all the people said, yeah, yeah, he's over in the tomb over here. And Jesus said, yeah, take me to see him. And Jesus cried. And all the people who were watching said, well, that's amazing. He really loved Lazarus, but he healed the blind man. Surely he could have prevented Lazarus from dying and come and heal him. So they took Jesus over to where the tomb was, and it was a cave carved into the rock with a stone in front of it. And Jesus said, roll away the stone. And Martha said, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. I don't think you realize he's been dead for four days. It's going to really stink. And Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believe me, you will see the glory of God? Roll away the stone. So they rolled away the stone. And Jesus lifted his hands to heaven and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me, but I'm saying this for their benefit so that they will believe. And then he said in a really loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man got up and started coming out, 
and he was bound with all the funeral clothing and his face was covered with a veil and Jesus said untie him and let him go free that's a story from God's word thank you thank you so we hear a, a very interesting example here is when God is accused of being late have we ever done that have we ever told God that if only you had showed up in my life earlier if only you had you know, come before my exam and, you know, help me before I failed or whatever <laughs> or something else. Mary and Martha both accused pretty much. They knew Jesus very well. They were close. So they had maybe the freedom or they felt comfortable speaking to him like that. But they actually just told him, Lord, if only you had come early. They did actually send for him. <laughs> they, they sent a messenger. Those days there was no other way of communication. They probably sent a, you know, somebody to go actually travel to where Jesus was. And Jesus pretty much sent the guy back saying, he preached something to the guy and he said about, you know, uh, about, yeah, this illness will not result in death. And the guy got confused probably and went back. Like he came hoping that Jesus would do something for Lazarus at that time. Anyway, so... The miracle is a very beautiful miracle. Um, this miracle about resurrection, actually, if you look in the chapters afterwards, also led, to, you know, Jesus' own death and resurrection followed, you know, a little bit later. So in one sense, he was setting the stage to show that he was the Lord of everything, including death. And nothing was beyond him, including time or death. They kept telling four days late, four days late, you know, I mean, in the end of the day, it didn't matter to Jesus. You know, so anyway, that is about God. You know, God is in control of everything. He's all powerful. He can, you know, conquer death, all of that. Uh, what I want to do something is to draw some attention, to, uh, your attention to three characters in this. Um, the, the people that are talked about in the story. I like data. I play with data every day. So I made a spreadsheet. So... It's just to give you an example, uh, just to help you understand. Martha was sad and disappointed. She expressed it to Jesus. If only you had come earlier, right? Yet, she's the one who went out running to Jesus. She's the one who expressed hope in the resurrection and who Jesus was. That was her reaction. Mary, all it says is she, was, she stayed inside the house. You know, she, when, when Martha went running out, Mary stayed back inside the house, and she was sad and she was disappointed. She expressed that to Jesus. The other one is the bystander who doesn't feel any of this. He doesn't feel sad about Lazarus dying. It's just uh, somebody, you know, who's watching all of this. They are the ones who are skeptic and using that occasion to uh, accuse Jesus of, of uh, not being who he really is or something like that. Said, so if he could heal this, why couldn't he have pre pre prevented Lazarus from dying? So think about those responses. Sometimes we might fall into these categories. We don't know. We all have different responses. So what was, what was Jesus' re uh, reaction? Let us look at that. Next slide. Jesus recognized how they felt. When, say, our prayers are not answered or they are delayed, God recognizes our sorrow, recognizes how difficult it is for us uh, how disappointed we are. So as you see, Jesus cried, Jesus wept, Jesus demonstrated that he cared. He cared, he understood how, how bad they felt. They had sent for Jesus, he didn't show up. When he, they, when he came, and you know, he kind of embraced that. Then he talked about God's glory being revealed through this incident. And they probably didn't fully understand what he was talking to, Jesus went on to demonstrate that God can turn back things like death and nothing is too late for him. And that, uh, as I said earlier, is also a miracle that sort of signaled that what was coming, death and resurrection, his own death and resurrection were coming soon after. So, again, what do we learn from all of this? We learn that God is always in control we looked in lives of uh, Daniel, um, Esther, Joseph. 
there they, he seemed to intervene sort of it was slow but still in time but Lazarus four days after his dying that was a first that was a very unusual or a bigger miracle in one sense right we learn that we can trust God no matter what if God asks us to wait for something we can because knowing that he fulfills his promises uh, you know, and, and as we wait for that, uh, we'll just see the next slide. We wait for that. We could be afraid. We could be worried. We could have all kinds of fears. But as the scripture continuously reminds us, as we submit our cares and worries to him, we can experience peace. Knowing that God keeps his promises uh, can help us even be joyful as we wait for those remembering all the things that God has done for us and continuously reminding that God has done it in the past and he will continue to do it. Uh, very favorite verse uh, for a lot of us, it would be Psalm 34 verse 10, the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. So the Lord is teaching, inviting us to trust, to trust more than we have trusted ever before. And then to pray, to pray more than we ever do. Now, this doesn't mean that God's always going to be delayed. This doesn't mean that I don't have to pray when I need, I'm in crisis. I'm not trying to say that God's going to give you an answer, always delayed, so you should have faith. But we are called to pray in all seasons. We are called to pray when we are in trouble. Psalm 46 tells us that God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. We pray for future relief. We pray for maybe something that's going to happen five years from now. We can still pray for that, for future grace that God gives us. We pray for wisdom to recognize the answers. Sometimes God has answered our prayers, and we have not recognized it. I don't know if it has happened to you all, but it has happened to me. Sometimes I felt God tell me, yes, I did answer that prayer, and I'd be like, when? And then he shows me something that had happened. Then all of a sudden, it, it makes sense to me. Wow, I never thought of that, as because I was expecting something different. But God had answered my prayers in a different way. Right? We pray for our heart to be safe against doubt. Because when prayers are not answered, when we're asked to wait, the enemy uses that time to put seeds of doubt, lies in our heart. Right? We ask, uh, we pray for protection against all of those. We also ask for patience in, in, in waiting. Learning not to get discouraged. Joseph, Esther, uh, and all the others, Daniel, they could have got discouraged, but they con chose to continue to worship and to stick to their faith and knowing the God that they worship. We can trust in his strength, holding on to his promises, knowing that no matter what, even if my prayer doesn't seem to be un answered right now, even if the period of waiting seems forever, that God's will for me will come to pass no matter what. So I have a few, few questions to ponder today. What do we do when God answers our prayer? We thank God, maybe we, 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 you know, we are grateful, or we just move on to the next item in the list, saying, this is done, now let, let me pray for the next one, right? What do we do when God asks us to wait? Are we angry with God? Are we disappointed? Do, is our faith shaken and are, is there seeds of doubt that have you know, sown and are also growing in our heart? What happens when, like I said, the exam is over, now why should I pray for it? You know, like in this case, Lazarus has died, so what now? Because they didn't expect, they couldn't imagine in their wildest dreams what Jesus was going to do. It was too late. It was just too late. God has forgotten about us. What is our reaction? Just want you to take a minute to think, think about what is your heart telling you? Are there things right now? Are there things right now you've been praying for for a long time? Are there things that God is asking you to wait? Think about those things. Are there things that seem to be over, all done and dusted and you're like, What's the point? Think about those things that God is showing you in your heart today. 
What have we learned about God through, through today's uh, reflection? Our God is timeless, who knows the beginning from the end. If you're going for an interview, he knows what, what's going to come on the other side. He knows not just if you get the job, what happens. If you don't get the job, what happens. And if you get the job and the work environment is a terrible place, he knows that too. If he knows the beginning and the end, that should give us some more reason to trust him, knowing that he holds the outcome. He knows the outcome. He's not limited by time, place, and person. He is faithful. So in this whole illustration, this, this you know, reflection this morning, we, we, we uh, think of God as faithful. He keeps his promises. He's sovereign. He's always in control, even if they look different or delayed uh, to us. We also saw that uh, Jesus understands what we experience. If we are upset with him, he's not going to chase us away for that. We have the liberty to express our feelings, how we feel about our situation, how we feel about the condition of our heart and our faith. And he is one who is able to choose the best for us and do things ultimately for his glory. So that is another big, uh, you know, thing, takeaway from all of this. In all these situations that, you know, we focused on Lazarus, we looked at three other examples. The goal was not the, you know, glorification or, uh, and uh, honor of those people. Yes, they got some blessing, they got some reward, all of that. But the ultimate glory of answered prayer is for God. If you do well in your exam, it's for his glory. It's not for us to feel better about ourselves. So this is something I wanted to share about who God is. I will read a small poem about God's timing. So I'll read this small poem quickly, um, but uh, think about everything that it says. God's perfect timing. In God's hands, time finds its flow. His perfect timing, may we know. In every moment, he is there, guiding us with love and care. In joy or sorrow, he is our guide. In him, our fears and doubts subside. With every breath, his presence near. In his perfect timing, we find cheer. Let's just take a minute to reflect on how God is always in control and always on time.